Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Reyes Ramirez with Fresh Arts. Um, so usually if you've tuned in before, thank you for coming back. Thank you for uh, knowing the right time to come back, uh, all these time changes and uh, really what is time anymore. But um, thank you for tuning in. If you haven't been here before, just to give you a rundown, uh, I am the Programs Outreach Coordinator for Fresh Arts, a arts nonprofit organization primarily based in Houston, but through our digital presence and website, uh, we've always had a digital online presence, but now more than ever, considering the COVID-19 crisis, we've been adapting um, through a series of videos and live streams uh, that serve as kind of entry points, but also um, kind of illuminating what we do uh, in regards to professional development for artists, resources for artists, uh, and what have you. Um, and so today, uh, this is part of a new series that we're gonna do, uh, where we're gonna interview individuals, either creatives or uh, arts uh, nonprofit leaders. And the th overall theme is gonna be about adapting and staying resilient. And what that means is that um, as artists, as creatives, um, we've always had to adapt. We've always had to know what best works for us so that people can see what we're doing. And so Fresh Arts, uh, what we want to do this month is highlight artists who are doing some interesting things with their work, uh, who are adapting and transitioning their work to a digital platform so that we can talk to them, get their viewpoints, why they made those decisions, um, and hopefully inform you, the viewer or the creatives, uh, the thought process of what to consider, what not to do, um, what to know beforehand, and really get a better idea of like maybe what you should do or what tips and pointers can be uh, apply to you. So we're hoping to have some really great discussions. We've had great discussions in the past. These will be a bit more fun um, and informal, but still sticking to the overall theme, how artists in Houston in particular are staying resilient and how they are adapting to the COVID-19 crisis. And so today we have some really great guests uh, to do that. But before that, let me do, um, so with this that in mind, as I just said, the workshops or the discussions rather, they'll be happening in this month in June. Uh, let me give you an overview of how the month is going to look like. So there you go. Thank you, Angela. So Adapting and Staying Resilient, it's going to be on Thursdays at 4 p.m. right here on Facebook Live. So today we have Cam Franklin of the Suffers and April Murphy. June 11th, next week, we'll be having uh, Teresa Escobedo and Jamie Robertson. They are both visual artists, uh, but, off, but take on different roles and put on different hats for different reasons but they are independent artists who are adapting to the COVID-19 crisis in their own cool, interesting way. And on June 18th, we'll have Marisa Castillo of Theatrix and Matt Manolo of Filipinx Artists of Houston. Uh, they are part of larger organizations, arts organizations that um, either put on programming or they put on resources, or they, they certainly serve as conduits of their community uh, best carry out their arts. And so Theatrix uh, will be uh, theater, performing arts, and Filipinx Artists of Houston is a mix of arts, but uh, certainly a visual arts organization. Um, even They have a diversity of, of the arts within the organization, uh, but Matt Manilow is a visual artist himself. And then June 25th, we'll then be featuring Houston Center for Photography, and writers in the schools. They are both uh, Organiz nonprofit organizations that, um, well, it's in their name. Uh, Houston Center of Photography focuses on photography, Rising the Schools focuses on the literary arts. And one thing they have in common is that they put on um, educational um, series or programs uh, using the arts, through the arts. And so Houston Center of Photography and Rising the Schools have both transitioned their education programs and pedagogy onto a digital online platform. And so that'll be an interesting conversation on how they've done that. And so again, hopefully for this month, we'll get a really good overview of what is happening in the Houston art scene, of how people, how artists and creatives are adapting to this crisis. And hopefully you'll get some inspiration and um, maybe you'll do the same and you can be featured on our show as well. So with all that in mind, I'm gonna introduce our guest today and we're gonna have a really great discussion. So I hope you're ready. So today we have Cam Franklin of the Suffers, uh, and we have April Murphy. So I'm just gonna do a real quick uh, fanboy moment. Uh, fan of both of your works, Cam. Uh, I think I heard you one time. Uh, when The first time I saw the Suffers was in Austin, 
I think uh, the Flamingo Bar or something like that, and you did an amazing cover of No, 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 and that's when I knew, that's when I knew I had to buy all stuff. So thank you, <laughs> so thank you for your work. And April, um, certainly your uh, GoFundMe is a, is a very inspirational uh, story of how artists are adapting to what is happening now. Um, and so we're gonna get to it. I'm gonna ask some questions. Feel free to answer however you can. And keep in mind, we'll also be taking viewer questions. They'll be posting it on Facebook and we'll be taking them. So viewers, if at any point you have any question, post it in the comments. Uh, my colleague, Angela Carranza, will then screen it and show it on screen and we can get those answered. So, all right, here we go. Um, so to start off this discussion, can you give an overview of your work and your usual practices uh, are or were? Um, so Cam, could you, yeah, answer that question in regards to how the suffers or how your art, you demonstrate, you carried out your practice of art uh, before all this? Uh, yeah, um, so before all of this, um, I toured with my band full time. Uh, we're called the Suffers and we are a eight piece band that uh, basically genre hops <laughs> around, music but uh yeah we we've traveled the the world the last few years this uh sunday is our nine year anniversary of doing this um and we were looking forward to just going on another uh tour around the country and then coming back and finishing our third record and so it's been strange to be home this time of year because i haven't seen this much of houston in about almost five years so a part of me is enjoying it, but. <laughs> April, same question. Uh, can you give an overview of your work and what your usual practices were before all this? Yeah, um, I have a studio here at Winter Street. And so we have, of course, open studios every second Saturday here. And we also have um, other special events also that are bigger events. And then I do a lot of traveling just as well. You know, so I do a lot of art festivals and my normal is about 35 shows a year. So I'm on the road a lot and, uh, and I love it. You know, I love being just popping up in another state and seeing a whole new group of people. Um, I like the adventure of it. And, um, but then, and I was able to get in four shows in Florida in February before it all came to a halt, right? I mean, my last show, in fact, in February, people were walking into my booth saying, I'm trying not to touch my face, you know? So I, I saw it starting to happen. Um, and then as soon as I got home, everything got canceled. And I book about eight or nine months out. And it was so strange to just all of a sudden have an empty calendar, so. Right, right. Now, I remember those initial, I went to a conference myself and uh, everyone's all like, oh, you know, like, uh, don't shake hands or, uh, and it was a very like, oh, you know, it was a very, um, you know, it wasn't as intense. Uh, maybe it should have been, but yeah, it's those kind of, cre those moments really do creep up on you. Yeah. Um, and here we are. Uh, so with that in mind, um, can we talk about, about how has the COVID-19 crisis affected you and your usual practice, um, and particularly what are you doing different now? So uh, April, can you start that off and then we'll go to- Yeah, um, so when I saw everything just disappear, you know, there's a moment of fear where you, you're just thinking, what do I do now? Um, but my biggest, my biggest gut feeling with that was to not give in to the fear, you know, that, that this was, um, I just needed to take a deep breath. And, uh, and then also to kind of ask myself, at the moment, what can I do for somebody else? You know, and that kind of that took the fear away and just got me in a whole nother lane. And so, I had been doing a series called uh, Three to Five Words, and what that, what that is is when I pass somebody running or hiking or whatever, and I catch a few words, I take those and write them down, and then I make up my own visual with someone else's words, right? So I've been doing that since November. And then when COVID hit, and then all of a sudden we're, you know, on a, basically a lockdown, you know, and there's no words to overhear, I started turning to news conferences and social media and also um, just, uh, you know, any kind of news in general. And, and I kept painting because 
I have to keep painting. You know, I think as an, and as an artist or as a musician, it's how we process everything. And I think often what we process um, helps other people, right? Helps them to deal with what we're all going through. And so I started posting those to my personal Facebook page just to, no links to buy anything because this definitely wasn't a time to let's go buy some art, right? And, but what I noticed was people were really responding to them. And in fact, I started having people messaging me say, and they would say, you know, I'm really looking forward to these every morning. And so I just kept on with it, you know, and, and what started to happen is it became, it became this whimsical, but respectful history of everything that we were going through, you know, day by day. Right, right. And we'll get into kind of more the, the mechanics of that and how you're doing that in a minute. Uh, but Cam, could you also answer that question? Uh, how has the COVID-19 crisis affected you in your usual practice and what are you doing differently now? Uh, I, I'm pretty similar to, to April as far as like when it first happened, I had a full blown panic attack, just like, oh my gosh, and you know, got through it. And then when I was able to just like really think and plan, I'm like, wait, I, I'm the art, you know, I create the art. Why am I tripping? Okay, I just have to figure out a new way to present it to the people. And, you know, something that I don't take for granted at all is that we are artists existing in an era of modern media and social media. And we are able to share our impact in a way that so many people aren't able to do. Um, when I was really first able, ready to combat what was happening, I just went through what I had. I was like, okay, we can't leave. And if I do leave, I'm putting people at risk. Okay, what do I have? And so I had all these clothes ready to go on tour with me, all the sequin, I own a lot of it. And I just started getting to work in my, my bedroom and I tore it apart and turned the corner of my bedroom into an all sequin art installation filled with things that made the room feel like a music video, music venue. And so I bought uh, uh, a fog machine and uh, some lights, but everything else we had already owned. I, I, I had invested in myself for years without realizing I would need it for something like this, you know, years of just being obsessed with wigs, thanks to my drag queen obsession. I was like, I need these wigs, you know, for what, I don't know. I have, you know, <laughs> I'm good, but like, you know, it, it allows me to feel like I'm somewhere else. Like, Oh, you know, on, on Saturdays now, until I'm allowed to go back on the road, you know, three o'clock, I'm treating it the way I would a normal show because I have to get that out, you know, how she was talking about how, how painting was something she couldn't stop. I couldn't stop performing. And I know how not performing is having an insane impact, not only on the artists that do it full time, but on the ones that were just, you know, that once that once a month thing was how they got their thing out. And so the fact that they have, have to have to still probably do their job if they still have one, and they can't play like it's it's just you know it's messing with everybody's uh psyche and so i've been really trying to to take advantage of the time um that i have right now well i was taking advantage of it. now i'm actively com combating racism nonstop right now uh but before this became a thing uh i was dedicating every single moment of my free time to myself and be that calling a family member or a friend that I haven't talked to in years uh, because of my life or, you know, really forcing myself to learn these instruments or these techniques that i have been putting off. And I'm April, I'm sure you know exactly what I'm talking about where you're like, I'm gonna learn that. Or I'm gonna try that different medium. Nah, but once she, once it became quarantine, I'm like, why, if I'm not going to do it when the world's kind of ending, you know, what am I doing? Like, I got time. I have, I have the space, you know, I'm so grateful to be in Houston during this because it, it's, it's just allowed me the space that is necessary that I know I wouldn't have gotten somewhere else. And so it's been trying, but uh, adaptable. 
So with that in mind, um, kind of going over what how y'all have adapted in your efforts and in your practice to best display what you do. Um, so Cam, what you've done is you pretty much, along with the suffers, created a kind of yeah, uh, like an online concert kind of uh, music series uh, where you stream on Facebook Live. Um, and you just mentioned kind of replicating that experience of being in a venue, of being uh, in a space where there's fog machines, there's uh, lights. Um, and so kind of like going into this next question, um, how did you come to decide that your current efforts and tactics work best for you? So like, I'm sure that's a process, right? Where you like, oh, okay, well, let's do this, well, let's do that. Uh, but you seem to fit a groove, um, especially tearing up your, <laughs> your room and making it into kind of its own venue. Um, how was that experience and why did you decide that was what was best for the sufferers or for your practice in art? Uh, my experience going into it was very terrible. It was very defeating every, every single day that I worked on this room, I felt defeated for like the first, it took me about a week and a half to put it all together because it's made out of like just reclaimed fabric and outfits that I was gonna wear on tour. I attached everything to the wall to make this like sequin space anyway. And you know, while I love art and I consume art, this was my first real like full on installation because I thought that my job was my job. And so I felt defeated in putting it together because while I, we've all seen musicians out here performing and doing a wonderful job with that, of performing at home, comfortable in their pajamas and with the guitar and just chilling and it's beautiful and vibey, that's not who I am. I don't want y'all seeing me comfortable. We, we're not together. Y'all haven't taken me out to dinner. You know, like you don't get to know that side of me. Like, that's just that's just not how I roll. And so I wanted to present something that I felt comfortable uh, both performing in and adjusting to. Um, but now I know that all that struggle was worth it from putting it together, learning the technical side of it, asking for help when I really just wanted to throw it all in the garbage can. I really thought about it. I was like, I could just send it all back. Like I got the receipts, like Amazon's cool. Like I have great history, like they'll take it all back. Um, but you know, now that I've, now that I've gained this education and I've been really able to, uh, learn the benefit of not only having it, but it, it it's made me earn such a new appreciation for the people that do work on the technical side every day that allow our productions to flow freely. You know, I've gotten into it with Lord knows how many uh, uh, venue sound engineers because of just normal, normal stuff that comes with uh, trying to make a show happen with someone that you don't know every single day, different person and dealing with all the isms that come with that. Um, I feel like when we come out of this, I will very clearly know the difference between when it's an ism that I'm having to fight or when they're just stupid, you know, because sometimes that's the thing. But it's like I am learning and I've been able to to gain a, an appreciation for their art and what they do so that when I do combat somebody that is coming at me with the nonsense, I, I'm ready. Yeah, uh, and, and then we can get into kind of learning different like, tech, like uh, skills and picking up different things to kind of uh, adapt in a moment. But April, can you kind of address that same thing uh, for you? you're doing a book. And so I uh, kind of mentioned your usual practice would be to do exhibitions, go to different places, markets, so your work, but now you've, you're have you kind of making your work into a book. And so could you kind of talk about why you felt that was best or how did you come to that? Yeah, so, you know, like I said, people were starting to follow follow all of them. And, and, uh, and so I started thinking of how to get this, because uh, I was just posting on, uh, putting them on my personal page, right? Not my business page. And I wasn't posting links to anything, but I started to think, how can I affect more people and, and spread this message um, a lot further? Because I, as I realized what I was doing is I was, I was creating a history book, but one that people could reflect upon later and it wouldn't be sad, right? Because what we're going through is, um, 
is really something, right? And so the idea of the book, I, I wanted to do a book because I also wanted to have a journal section inside of it where you can um, record your own history. And there is there are these uh, word prompts that um, are you know question prompts that help you. And I think it's important to write all that down because, and especially when it's still kind of fresh, and then you can come back and look at it on another day, another year or 10 years from now and remember what that was like, you know? And so Kickstarter is what I decided to use as my vehicle. And I had never done anything on Kickstarter. I knew nothing about it, but I did know that I wanted to have a way to, for people to pre-order books and so I figured out what my budget would be. And I also wanted to do go the traditional printing route because I wanted this to be a coffee table book. And I have a background in publishing. And in fact, the company that is publishing is, is a company I used to work for 25 years ago. So, um, so I've got some contacts there and that felt safe and comfortable. And the rep that I'm using is somebody I know very well. So, and in fact, he had some experience with Kickstarter. So that helped as well. And you know, like I said, I knew nothing about Kickstarter, but I just started um, doing a lot of research. There are all kinds of blogs out there for people that have done successful campaigns that you can actually, um, you know, look at all of their advice. And some may work for you and some may not. You have to decide, you know, what works best for your own content. But um, and I also looked at other Kickstarter campaigns, you know, just to see what they were doing and what kind of graphics and all of those kinds of things. And um, it was actually really fun to do this. And, and like Cam said, if I hadn't slowed down enough for this to happen, I would have never done this. You know, so I'm, I'm so busy always just packing everything in my van, taking it out on the road that I don't take, take time out to figure out technology. Right. And so all of a sudden here I was with nobody around me and no distractions. And it was the perfect time for this to happen. And I don't think I would have ever come to this had there not been this pandemic, right? And and I'm seeing now that this is a clear path of where I want to go in the future. So I, I'm almost grateful I say that. I mean, you know, I really, you know, it's it's a sad time, right? But but I'm grateful for the slowdown so that I can kind of take stock again and, and really figure out what my next five years are supposed to be like. Yeah. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to show uh, the digital presence y'all have, and then I'll follow up with some questions. So I'll start off with Cam. Uh, so let me just do my share screen real quick. Let's see if I can get to, there we go. Oh, so if you go to the suffers.com, um, right, and then you go here, you go down, you click on this link, to watch live on Facebook every Saturday at 8 p.m. Takes you to here, to the Facebook page. And from what I understand, you can check out all the videos uh, that y'all have done. Oops, let me. All right, so we're loading that up. And I think what's really cool is, again, as you mentioned before, Cam, that you know, kind of transforming your space uh, into a concert light venue, and it shows, and it looks really great. Uh, it looks awesome. Um, we had a lot of trouble adapting our space to like do these live uh, kind of videos. And here you kind of went, it seems like you had fun with it. You, you went really, really far with it, and it's really great. Um, I'm not gonna play a sample, uh, but y'all can do that at your on your leisure. Uh, so, with that in mind, uh, could you talk about like maybe what other things you looked at that gave you inspiration to kind of create that kind of like space? Because um, for us, you know, I think first we had like a newsy, like a news broadcast, uh, and we were trying to do our best to kind of live that out didn't really work out. So we went from like having posters in the back, we were having all kinds of things. And now we've got this really great thing going for us that works for us. So what did you look at? Um, what inspired you kind of make that space? Um, honestly, I think I was probably most inspired by the Afrofuturism and the representation of uh, 
what I would see on the Parliament album covers and uh, a lot of the Bootsy Collins stuff and um, just watching old Sun Ra and, and Alice Coltrane and just really uh, tapping into my higher self as a black woman and as an artist and realizing that, okay, you know, this pandemic's trying to take, take me over. I, I had to go to a fantasy place to really enjoy what I needed to enjoy about uh, performing so that I could give that back to people. You know, um, while I'm always grateful for the opportunity to perform, I never want to uh, present a show that's less than my personal standard of, of good. And I wanted people to feel like they were escaping someplace with me when they were watching. And so, you know, I, I went to the, uh, the African American Museum in DC uh, quite a bit last year for a, uh, a songwriting fellowship and ended up just consuming so much. But every day I was there, I would see the parliament mothership in the exhibit. And to see that once is a lot, but to see it multiple times and over and over again, and to really just think about where George Clinton's head was and uh, where a lot of these black artists that really just thought about space and just appreciated it and its fantasy and everything fun that came with it. Because, you know, in, in my brain in space, I'm an equal citizen, you know? So like, <laughs> I was like, I want to take people somewhere else. And so I built the, the sequin sanctuary so that if you're coming into my world, my space, you know, I am the queen. Everything is peaceful here and everything is vibey. And I feel like when you watch now, maybe not the first two or three, because your girl was still learning how everything was working. Uh, I feel like when you watch now, um, we are somewhere else for an hour. And for an hour, aside actually from last weekend, because I absolutely had to talk about everything that was happening with uh, George Floyd. But um, my goal every week is to allow people to go somewhere else through the art, because I feel like that is what it's about, the escape and the enjoyment and, and the relief that it brings. And I know that if you're at your house and you're not able to go to a club the way you like to go to the club, maybe you want that vibe a little bit. And so like that, that's what I try to do. I try to make you feel like you're at a concert, but like, you know, one where people aren't talking over the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, going back to the masters, I think that's a great, great idea. Um, and so you, I think it's it's gorgeous. I think you did a really great job. Uh, so thank you for sharing some of that, some of your inspiration with that. Um, so I'm gonna go to April. I'm gonna show uh, April's website. Then I'm gonna show kind of the what, where you have that existing, and then we can talk about that. Mm -hmm. So let me share my screen. Do, do, do. There we go. And so if you go to aprilmurphy.com, uh, you go over here and your, um, I mean, you can buy your art, visit the studio, uh, but this is what kind of we're more uh, discussing. And I really love this cat uh, graphic right here. So if you got to click three to five words um, and here we can have, you can see the book, we can see some of the images, uh, some of the work that you've done um, and you kind of give the text and the backdrop, uh, which is all great. And so could you kind of talk about maybe some, what did you look to for inspiration? Uh, like what gave you the format to work with that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, like I said, I had a, a long list of words, you know, that I just kept on my table. And, um, and I didn't, you know, it wasn't, sometimes I was inspired in a different way. So sometimes I would just blindly write down all these words from news conference, right? As it's going on, and I'm I'm halfway not listening to the news conference. I'm more concentrating on those three to five words that are that I'm hearing amidst Sorry, it. Right? Can I ask, like, what prompted you to do that? Kind of like, why why um, were you writing down three to five words? Because um, because I couldn't go out and hear those three to five words anywhere, right? And so because before my whole concept of three to five words was it was me passing another conversation and, and only picking a few words. And in fact, the first one that uh, inspired the whole series was there were 17 hearts. 
And I have no idea what that conversation was about, but I was intrigued by those words. And so I started writing them down in November like that. And then, and my, my work is very whimsical. It's all animals. And so I just had my visuals be, be the story. And it might, and most of the time it was not related at all to whatever that story is about. You know, it's, it's basically two separate things. It's like your, your words, but my own story. And so when we were in the stay at home phase where I'm not seeing anyone, you know, um, I just, I don't know why I went to that, but I just felt like I needed to do that. And, and, um, some of them, the words come, come first and some of them I draw the little drawings first and half the time I'm looking at both of them and then pairing them together. Right. And, um, and then I was also real cognizant of like, I want there to be a variety of animals. You know, I don't want to have too many dogs, too many cats, too many penguins, whatever. Uh, and I wanted it to be light and airy and basically a commercial break from all the bad news. You know, I mean, it was still topical, but a breather. And um, so when I launched the Kickstarter campaign, I mean, I haven't felt that much um, nervousness in a very long time. I mean, I felt like I was really putting myself out there because I was asking for $26,000 because, you know, and the printing of that was almost 20. So, and I didn't know if I could raise that kind of money. You know, here we are in a pandemic, you know, what am I thinking, you know, that I can raise that kind of cash, you know, when everybody's kind of pulling everything in, right? But I just felt um, intentional about it. You know, there was just something where I was like, I'm doing this. And, and me being that intentional, I think drew my people in with me. And, um, and it, was, it was super exciting. You know, I, I say it was scary and my hands were sweaty whenever I pushed that launch button for Kickstarter. Um, but at the same time, it was a really great distraction for me, you know, to have this going on during this time and also for everyone who followed me because everyone got involved and watched that ticker go up, go up. Right. And as my, my mom is 81 and lives in Galveston and has been watching this whole Kickstarter thing. And it frankly has kept her going. And she would tell me, you know, I'm watching the Kickstarter numbers go up and that's good news. And I'm watching the COVID cases go up and that's bad news, you know, but I was providing her and all the people around me with something to look forward to, you know? Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, so let me bring Cam back in. Um, so next we're kind of going to get into the nitty gritty of the logistics of how do you pull off these things? Um, so, Cam, in terms of like uh, doing this, like I imagine for sound quality, and as you mentioned, the sound engineers are working with people, and obviously the sound is incredibly important. It's integral to your craft, to your work. How do, do you have any recommendations or do you have, can you share kind of like what equipment you've been using, what softwares to kind of give, as you said, like that concert, that venue feel? Yes. Um, so, I, I want to make it clear before I get into it that, uh, you know, the way that I am running this show, I am aware of the financial privilege that it takes to even have just the little bit of capital to start. Now, I believe that you can achieve a live stream show uh, the way that I'm doing it for under like 300 bucks, which isn't that much when you think about the amount of money that you could be generating as opposed to not doing anything. Um, but the most important piece is something called an interface, an audio interface that allows you to run uh, your, your microphones or your instruments or whatever's coming out of your computer into it so that the device itself is basically like a host of all of all of the sound that you're processing. And then there are wires that go in the back of it that come out through a speaker or through a cable that you would connect to uh, 
the software that you're using on your computer or through uh, a device that you would connect to, to your phone. Um, there's tons of different ways to do it. Everybody does it differently. Um, I use a, 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 a program called Ecamm Live, and I also pay a monthly subscription fee of, I think it's like $12 or something for the pro version. There's a way fancier version you can get that I think is like more money, a lot more money, something I didn't like. Uh, and then they also have a free one, but the free one has like ads and, and all of that. So if you don't want the ads through that, you would have to pay. I know that OBS is a similar software that is free um, and it takes a little bit more time to get it going successfully. I did not have that time. I was manic. So your girl spent a little subscription fee and I am happy to have that headache gone every week, every week that I don't have to do all the other steps. Um, that being said, uh, some of the gear we already owned, um, like the head, the headphones and the microphones, and uh, I have a speaker that is connected to my interface. I am not able to connect my audio to a uh, to to both Facebook and an Instagram stream 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 at the same time. There are other platforms that will allow you to stream simultaneously, like I believe like YouTube and Facebook and Twitch and whatnot, but Instagram has not gotten with the program that everybody wants them to get with yet. Um, so that being said, I always tell folks, if you wanna watch our show on Instagram, the sound's not gonna be that great, but you at least get a better show because there's more legs on Instagram. <laughs> and then on Facebook, that's where I run the, the sound directly into it. Um, it took a lot of trial and error and I kept doing a lot of stuff wrong. I kept thinking everything was broken because I'd get frustrated or I would try to start before I'd eaten something. So my brain wasn't working the way that I know it can work. Um, but, you know, after a few weeks of trial and error and knowing like, dang, I got to make sure I'm looking out for updates and make sure, making sure that I'm paying attention to technical stuff that, usually would be uh, a job for someone else in my in my company but um now it's me and i i'm really just learning every week into someone that is just getting started and trying to figure it out youtube saved me and be very specific whatever it is that's broken or not working in quotations when you type it into youtube so you can save yourself a little bit of time um but just trying to find people that had done this before this was a new this is a new medium you know and a lot of the folks that were doing anything similar were just you know you, youtube musicians which is their own kind of uh of genre of art as far as like you know they don't really tour but they release new music and they have subscribers y'all know how that part works anyway um i was so grateful to them and the ones that had taken the time to do the how-to video was how to video saved me. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll get into kind of uh, some other aspects of like that experience, especially monetizing it in a, in, a, in a minute. But April, could you also speak to kind of recommending or like kind of showing or know, uh, letting people know what software is, what interfaces you're using, in particular because one, you know, uh, you paint. And so how do you get that high quality image onto a computer um, in the way that you want it to be presented and then making it into a book format uh, on your site. You so say you have experience as a graphic designer. I mean, yeah, what softwares do you use, equipment, all so, that kind of stuff. Yeah, so um, the, my husband is a photographer, which is very helpful. And he takes photographs of all my work. And these uh, images in particular have a lot of texture and I add lots of pieces onto them. So it's important that you see a lot of that, you know, so you almost feel like you can feel it. And, um, and then um, for my platforms, um, the first thing was to get everybody excited about what I was doing, right? And so um, I started doing videos. Um, I had, you know, the thing about Kickstarter is the, the ones that are successful, almost all of them have a video track that they put up there. So you want to make sure, and this is all stuff that I read. I mean, like what Cam was saying, you know, doing your research and, um, you know, 
looking at all the help files that other people have already gone through this is a very good way to avoid mistakes at the beginning, right? And um, I still made some mistakes, but you know, um, everything's pretty fluid right now. So, and I think people forgive all those little things, you know, because we're all going, we're all feeling our way through this. Um, but I, um, on Kickstarter, um, I put some of the spreads. So I, I use in, uh, InDesign to do my book, right? And so I would take some, uh, make some PDFs and then making make them into JPEGs and then post the spreads. And then I uh, mocked up the book cover so people could really get a feel for what that looked like. And, uh, and then the videos, I had never really done much videos. I mean, the videos that have that I have out there are videos that other people have done of me, you know, people with experience, people who have those big booms and everything that you need to make it sound great. And, you know, the, the, the lights and everything. And so, you know, I mean, at the beginning of the first one I did, I come into the, the, the video and it's shaky because I tripped over the trip tripod, you know? And so you see a little bit of that, greediness, I guess, you know, or just me being new at this. But I also kind of liked that part of it, you know, because it, it showed where we all are right now. You know, we're, we're all kind of just getting through this. And the fact that the video was kind of raw and my hair, you know, I hadn't had it cut in a long time and I had all this gray and I had no makeup on, which I don't wear that much anyway, but I usually have a little more than that. Right. And so that was all just fine, I think, you know, and I wanted people to to feel the authenticity of the project. Right. And um, and the fact that what I'm trying to do here is not just about profiting from a book. It's about reaching out to people just like Cam is saying, you know, and to give people a, a vacation from all this a little bit. Right. And so I also, um, the other thing, Facebook and Instagram, I was real heavy on both of those. And um, I had a, um, a spreadsheet of, that where I had a plan for everything I was going to post. And sometimes, you know, things changed a bit, but I had the whole month kind of planned out how I was going to campaign on Instagram and Facebook. And also the most important thing for me that I found was I created a spreadsheet and this is something I learned from one of the Kickstarter blogs was to create a list of all of your uh, important people. So I have a list of people that are my huge supporters, the, one that, the ones that come in here and buy large paintings, right? And then I have this list of influencers, which are people who know a lot of people. And then I have this list of my grassroots effort that these people that comment on everything that you post, they're, they're very important too, because they push your uh, content out into the world. You know, the more they comment, the more other people see it. So I'm very grateful for them as well. And, uh, and then, you know, the people that have support, supported me throughout the years, and I've not always been that great about keeping up with this. And so this forced me to sit down and really create um, a roster of everyone I know. And so going forward, this list will continue to be very important to me. And, uh, and I'm very grateful that um, those blogs are out there to provide me with that kind of information, you know? Yeah, uh, hopefully I can ask uh, just a really quick follow up. So I'm interested in graphic design. I, I design my chapbooks and I print them, but the usual way I print them because their chapbooks are not so big. I just go yeah. to uh, uh, print place or copy copy place uh, and I just print it out myself uh, but you you're growing a little bit more high quality than that mm -hmm. so with like I imagine with gloss pages and yep. a hard book hard uh, hardcover um, yeah. who did you go to or who do you so I, I mentioned that I had contacts you know with the publishing company a long time ago uh, it was a yearbook company it used to be called Taylor and now it's called Balfour and they have a fine books division and so I have a lot of contacts through that company that I've still kept in touch with, you know, and so I felt very comfortable going to them, knowing that it was going to be a quality product in the end. Um, and having the graphic design experience, I, when I did work for them, I published a magazine for that went out to all the high schools, you know, telling kids how to, you know, design your book or uh, 
you know, best practices for certain sections in your book or um, how to have a great cover or theme. And um, so all that um, knowledge kind of came full circle, you know, and now I'll admit that I was a little bit rusty. Like I was nervous about, okay, I haven't, I've done InDesign the whole time I've been, had a career as an artist, but I haven't put a book together in a long time and I don't know what's changed and what hasn't. Um, but I've kept up enough that um, I still feel really comfortable with it. And any questions I have, it's all on the internet, right? So nothing, there is nothing that you have, that you have a question on that is not there answered somehow. So, you know, there, there are so many helpful people out there. And sometimes I'm, I think, why are they doing this? Why are they like just taking the time to make this instructional video and asking for nothing really. Right. And they're saving me a lot of time. So I kind of feel like, you know, I'm really glad you're doing this because I'm hoping that maybe what I've been through or what, what I'm going through now can inspire somebody else and that I can answer some of those questions too. Yeah, and kind of one thing that we can believe at Fresh Arts is like the entry points are and the basic skills are easy in a way that's now getting people to actually enjoy it or to buy it or to, to kind of feed that practice in a monetary way. And so I kind of want to go into that part of the discussion of like monetizing your your presence, your online digital presence. Um, so Cam, could you kind of talk about like uh, you know, how the suffers are kind of adapting to that digital and having that online presence um, and how to kind of monetize that. How are y'all making kind of, because you said it's it's expensive. It requires capital to pay for those subscriptions for that software, for the equipment that you might have to kind of invest in. And so, yeah, can you kind of go into like making that decision and how do you get monetized from that? Yeah, so there, there are endless ways to get monetized from this. And there, in my opinion, um, is no wrong way until you have determined that it is the wrong way. When you're first trying to figure out something that's new, um, the sufferers, you know, not touring is our number one revenue stream and not being able to uh, tour the way that we usually do. I, I, the, the, you don't even want to know what the math looks like as far as the decrease. However, um, no, as a business owner, something you learn early is that you need to, if, if you know that you are capable of producing multiple revenue streams, you figure that out. So, okay, we can't tour. We can, we can ship merch. We can't tour. We can release, you know, some live music that we've been sitting on that has that just needs to get mixed and mastered. We can't tour. Oh, okay, great. We can work on uh, strengthening our our bond as a band through the Zoom by just communicating with one another in a way that we haven't really been able to do uh, in a in a while. Uh, reconnecting and figuring out how we can learn from maybe our project mistakes of the past and you know moving forward. But I I say all of that because clear communication and being on the same page, especially if you're working from apart like we are, that's going to mess with your money. Everyone has to be on the same wave towards the same goal. Um, our, we have tips set up uh, every week when I do these live streams. So that's its own form. Sometimes it's, it's, it's bigger than other weeks. But I always say it's more than zero dollars. And, you know, at a time like this, when a lot of people are making zero, you know, that that's where I'm functioning. OK, cool. So we have that. Then it's like, OK, what else can we do? Trying to figure out once that setup is there and you have your your live uh, uh, stream set up, be it through Ecamm, OBS or whatever it is that you choose to, to do, you can then start reaching out to brands or corporations or companies that are right now asking for artists. Some of, some of them are asking for live painting. Some of them are asking for musicians. And then there's all other forms of art that haven't been tapped into yet. But anybody that follows what's happening in the economy right now, a lot of people aren't making money, but who's making money? Alcohol companies. You, It'd be a perfect time. Hey, can I get a Deep Eddie Presents? Can I get a Hennessy Presents? Maybe you like drinking something else. I don't know. Try to find out who their PR person is. 
because I know they're working from home. People still drinking heavily. You know, there are other ways, but you have to think like a, like a true entrepreneur. And a lot of folks, when they go into art as a business, they don't want to think about the business. It's, oh, I'm an I'm a artist, I'm a musician. Like, I don't, I don't like thinking about money. You can't think like that until you can afford to think like that. If you are successful as an artist to get to a point where you can have those people that think about the money for you, awesome, amazing. But until then, you're the boss. And if the boss ain't working, like, what, what are you expecting? And so, you know, right now, our monetization is a part of our overall happiness as a band. And like, that's just normal for a business. However, it's not everything. And so we are trying to focus on new, innovative, creative, but fun ways for us to share what it is that we do with the people and with the masses without changing the quality, even though we're apart and without changing the love again, even though we're apart, because, you know, what allows folks to connect and, and feel something that that is just another piece of the monetization, because if something makes me feel good, I'm going to buy it. You know, I, 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 that, that's just the type of person that I am. Um, and I hope that who I am as a human and the, the choices that I make, I hope that I attract that same energy as far as the people that support me in my work. I don't have control of who is a fan, but that's something that I like to believe. And so, you know, I, I do my best to just be like, I love y'all. I miss y'all, you know, like, and, and to be real with it because I do miss playing out there. I do miss going out there. And I know that they miss being outside too. So trying to make sure that you're still kind of maintaining that relationship with your customer in the same way that you're hitting up your friends because we're far apart your family because we're far apart like your fans and the people that consume your art whatever it might be they want to hear from you they want to talk to you just like how she was talking about her the uh, how how april was talking about her her kickstarter list those people are investing in you because they believe in you and so what does that mean they want to hear from you if you're struggling as an artist like it might be worth some consideration to let them know that you're, that you're dealing with it. If you're sad because of, you know, all the black people in your life are sad, like talk about it. Like it, the, these people want to know that the artists that they're investing in are relatable, that whatever brand that it is that you have that like, they feel like they're doing a little bit of good by investing in you. So you just got to think about yourself like a business and the monetization will naturally come as you develop strong ideas. Yeah, yeah. And kind of, uh, again, sometimes the graphic will show on um, where it's ca in, in your videos. Uh, you have posters that say Cash App, Venmo, PayPal. So you have all those different venues. Of Sorry, it. that's another thing. Sorry to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Having multiple ways for people to pay you is important. I hate having all these signs up, but you know what? Money comes through all ways. Sometimes it's twenty dollars over here, it's a hundred dollars over. It's it. You don't know what it's gonna be. But the thing is, is that as the world continues to evolve, I want to be able to get paid in as many ways as possible. Absolutely. And kind of going into my conversation with you, April. So Cam has all these, and the suffers have all these different venues. Uh, you particularly chose Kickstarter. Uh, could you kind of go into making that decision as opposed to like Indiegogo or uh, mm -hmm. uh, FundMe, all that good stuff? So I picked Kickstarter because it's more of an, it had more of an entrepreneurial feel to it. So what you see on there are, are you get something for your money. You know, you're not, like, I didn't want to present myself as, oh my God, all my shows went away. I need money, right? I, I wanted it to be, Hey, I'm an artist. I created something really cool. And if you want it, you got to reserve it. Right. And so I wanted to create something exciting. And I didn't, the biggest thing is I didn't want to put myself out there as um, being frightened, you know, and, and running scared and, and selling my artwork at half price. Right. I, I wanted to go a whole different direction from that. And Kickstarter, um, just in doing all the research for the other platforms, it just for whatever reason, it really res resonated with me the most. And, um, you know, I also, 
the other thing that happened too, we were talking about, you know, here you are and you got no shows and what happens. Um, I had a lot of shows that were already booked, right? And when, when they started canceling one after the other, fortunately for most all of them, I got my money back. And so, and then my hotels, I booked all of them in advance and a lot of them I prepaid, right? But I made sure they were refundable. And so when I went to hotels.com and I just went through like eight months of hotels and you know, all that money came back in my account. And then here's this other thing that I'm not out traveling and spending any money, you know? So, so I don't have the cash flow problems that I might've had had I, have, had I been trying to go out and do all this um, during something like this. So, um, so those made it, those made me relax just a little bit at the beginning to not be fearful for at least the next month while I'm working on the Kickstarter project. And then what happens with Kickstarter is after 30 days and you can make it 60 days, but 30 days to me is more of a, Hey, you got to get this. You know, if I drag it out another 30 days, people are always going to, you know, uh, procrastinate a little bit. So, um, I, um, really pushed that, you know, that, and then I pushed it on all of my, um, like I said, all on all of my channels that are social media, but I also have a, a big presence on Etsy. So anytime that I posted a three to five words image, there was always a little subtle link underneath it. Oh, Hey, here's a print, you know? And so, and then, and I did, but I didn't do it in a way where it was in anybody's face. Like I want to do it tastefully, you know, like not buy me, buy me, buy me. But I figured the people that if they wanted the original piece, they're going to message me. You know, these people already know how to get a hold of me. And so I don't have to beat you over the head to say, oh, please, please buy this. Um, I think it's just more of a soft sell. And, and for me, that's important. You know, we all have different ways that we sell. But those things really have gotten me through this month. And, and then I did this thing on, on the last page of my book. Um, it's a feel good army and it's all these little animals marching in a feel good army. And I sold those spots and to people to, so I would put their animal in there. And so that page generated income on Etsy as well. Right. And then the other thing that I did was that um, a lot of my rewards on Etsy were, I mean, on Kickstarter were not just the book. Um, I did original art for people, or I also had some big awards where it would be your three to five words and your animal in a large piece. And I don't do commission work anymore. So this was something that went pretty quickly and I didn't realize, I mean, I put four of those up there at the beginning and all four of those went in the first week. So I went back the next week and put six more up there at a higher price and sold all but two of those. Um, so, you know, um, you know, like, like Cam said, there's so many different ways, you know, that if you can just think creatively and as an artist, we all are pretty creative, right? Um, I mean, I just was never not thinking about how can I make this happen? All right. So out of respect for your time, uh, we're going to, go ahead and go into the final stages of this. Um, so I'm gonna ask you one question and then we're gonna get to any statements or uh, shout outs, anything you, you wanna get out there. So uh, final question, um, and Cam, you can start off first. What's been the biggest takeaway from this experience for you as an artist, as a business owner? Yeah. Uh, the biggest takeaway for me as, as an artist is that we are capable of so much more than we give ourselves credit for. Um, you know, I, I'm really proud of myself and I know that this, this pandemic and the stress that it's brought upon uh, so many people and, and like j just absorbing other people's energy, like that's a part of what I do. And so I've been taking on a lot and, and sharing and I've been creating at a pace that I've, I've never really gotten to create at before. So it's been so, so fun to just see myself really thrive during this period as, as a creator. But uh, as a businesswoman, it has made me appreciate my team and the people that help my business function in a way that I just, I know I truly didn't appreciate before. 
you know, I, I know that when it's time for me to start touring again, you know, me and the sound folks, we, we're going to have a, a, like, we kicking it. Like, we're going to have a, a good day and we're going to know each other. And, you know, I want to make sure that they know that I appreciate what they do. But also, like, what I, what I and my band do together, we cannot function without the listener, without the people at the club, without the people doing every small detail. So the, just that community and that appreciation of self is what I'm taking from all of this. And uh, I, I loved everything that April had to say as far as, you know, all the different routes that she that she's had to go through to make it clear that she's a hustler more than uh, some a survivor or something you should be taking pity on. And that entrepreneurial mindset is what the most, the more successful artists you usually see uh, have is that ability to hustle and and thrive when things like this, even though we've never seen anything like this before, um, happen. Thank you, April. Uh, same question. Any? What is what is the biggest takeaway you have from this entire experience? So, yeah. So I think I need to continually expand my network. I mean, I've had I've had good luck and um, connecting with a lot of people through all the shows that I do and be, being all over the country. But it's I think more important than I ever realized, right? And um, and you can't, I feel like I, you can't go back to the well too many times. So I've just made it my commitment to spend more time uh, reaching out to, to new people. And, um, you know, I had a LinkedIn account that was sort of, I don't know, it just was dead over there. And I'd, every now and then I'd see these things, so-and-so wants to connect, I'd be like, oh yeah, whatever. I'm an artist, I don't do LinkedIn. But now I'm realizing it might be kind of important because I'm, I've got this book, right? And I hate it. sorry, don't let them trick you. You can have a LinkedIn, but it's, <laughs> you're, you're fine. Don't let them trick you. I know. And, and so, maybe, but not LinkedIn. Get out of here. No, yeah. Man. Yeah. So it, um, it, that has been great. And actually I've connected with some people on LinkedIn who have mentioned me on shows now. Right. So are in newsletters on LinkedIn. So, so I know it's it's a good place for me, and I need to really start maybe you know doing some research research on how to improve my own page there, you know. And um, also, I think the the other big thing is the world slowed down enough for me to kind of reexamine like what my role is going forward, and maybe just maybe I don't have to be doing so many shows like I've really enjoyed my time here in the studio and like just coming here every day and and you know I'm starting to get appointments now for people coming and I have to be careful because I, I've gotten so used to not even looking at my phone you know that I, I've almost missed a few of those but I think um, I've really enjoyed thriving during this just like what Cam said and feeling like I had this pulse on what's happening and that I can bring something to others in such a difficult time. Right. And I want more of that, you know, I, I mean, I, 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 in fact, I'm kind of thinking, okay, what's the next book, you know, and I still want to do shows because there is nothing like connecting, you know, face to face. And as Cam says, people buy from you because they feel connected to you. And so my job now is to, to not only connect, you know, online and, and, you know, doing these kinds of new things I'm doing, uh, but also connect um, out in the public as well. So, so now having um, more avenues to do that, you know, I think it's been a great learning experience because, you know, I mean, I've been, you know, pretty, pretty good about Facebook and pretty good about Etsy, you know, but I pretty much, I don't know, I wasn't doing much on Instagram and certainly not LinkedIn or Zoom or, you know, what, or Facebook, what we're on today, the, the live. Um, I, I think this is all going to be, these are all going to be tools that I'm certainly going to use going forward besides just connecting, um, you know, in person. 
All right. So finally, uh, I'll start with you, April. Please, can you? Uh, would you like to make any statements? Would you like to share any links? Any mm -hmm. ways that people can stay tuned with your work? Yep. So Kickstarter, my Kickstarter closed this morning at 8 a.m. or 7:58, I should say. And when it did, your pa your page is there forever. And so there is a, if you go to Kickstarter and you just type in three to five words, uh, three, the, you type it out, not the numbers, my page will come up there. But you can also just go to my website and like you showed there, um, you can click on three to five words. And I, what I did was I now moved my um, link over to Etsy so you can reserve the book now on Etsy instead of Kickstarter so that it continues to go. And I will decide on my, um, the amount or how many books I'm going to print in the next month or so kind of based on what the numbers are coming in for what people are reserving. Cause you know, the thing is this has been a great experience, but it is a book about COVID-19 and I don't want to have, you know, 2000 books sitting around three years from now going, Oh yeah, COVID-19, right. You know, so I'm, I want to be very um, uh, good about, not uh, wasting, right? And just print kind of about what I need. And and then I have other ideas for books down the road that, um, I don't know, this is kind of, Kickstarter has just made me think there is so much you can do on Kickstarter. And although I asked for $26,000, there are plenty of small projects there that someone who just say, just wants to, has a series of artwork say, you know, and I saw this on one of them, they, it was a somebody who had, like eight paintings that were all the same series. And all they did was they posted a link. If you want my my whole series, it's this much. And they created a whole page and their, their um, budget was maybe $2,000 and Kickstarter is all or nothing. So you want to be careful about what you put on there because you don't get it unless it gets funded. Right. But you can start small. You don't have to start big like I did. So I think it's a really great uh, format to um, explore. Thank you. Cam, same thing. Any final statements, any links, any ways that we will continue to follow? Uh, yeah, I would encourage everyone um, every Saturday night, I am going to be on the Suffer's Instagram and Facebook doing a live stream performance. This Saturday, I believe, is my 10th show of COVID. And uh, I would encourage you to go to thesuffers.com and just get to know us if you don't know us already. And Check out some happy music. We're releasing a new single June 23rd called Take Me to the Good Times, which I hope is where we'll get to go one day. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I want to say thank you for the opportunity. It's been so great uh, listening to to April and her her journey. And yeah, the, I've enjoyed and it too. Platform. And Black Lives Matter. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just want to say, y'all, thank you for this opportunity to inspire other people. I think it's a great series. Um, Really um, happy to do it for you. Thank you both so much. Um, yeah, and I'll see you around. Best of luck to all of your, your projects, your endeavors, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. All right, there you have it. Uh, we went a little bit over time, but hey, that's just the way good conversations go. But they, they have to finish sometime, but they go so quickly. So again, hopefully that was incredibly helpful to, to you. I know I picked up some stuff uh, just from listening to them. So again, uh, a lot of great tips, a lot of ways to move forward from this discussion, uh, but that's how we do here at Fresh Arts. So again, thank you again to the amazing, amazing guests. So now I'm gonna do is I'm gonna offer some uh, other follow-ups to this. So today the Artist Resource Newsletter went out um, where there was a lot of great grants fellowships and calls for entries that are still happening, that will happen. Their deadlines are coming up, including some deadlines for Monday. So go to our Facebook page to see today's if you're not subscribed. And if you're not subscribed, why not? It's free. A lot of great information from there that I find or that people submit to us. So again, apply, 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 subscribe, um, and get your stuff out there. Uh, so again, on the on that note that there's no resource roundup next Tuesday. We will all, we will be transitioning that time slot to the Tuesday, the last, the first Tuesdays and the last Tuesdays of the month, mainly because the first Tuesday uh, will have a good sample of uh, the, 
of the artist resource newsletter to then follow through with um, in the last Tuesday to kind of follow up on any deadlines or anything like that that you should know that uh, I feel that you should know for you to get your work in there in time. So just note that. Uh, another note is that um, go to our website where you can then check out all the other uh, resources we have. You can watch an archive of our videos, including this one, which we'll be posting later. Uh, you can visit our website to see the upcoming uh, workshops we have. So I'm going to share my screen real quick to show you how to do that. Just really quick. So if you go to our website, fresharts.org, just go over here to succeed as an artist and bam, right there, workshops and peer labs. Click on that. You get an overview of all the workshops we've done. But if you click right here on the upcoming schedule, that's where you're gonna get a sample and an idea of what we're how we're gonna move forward with this series. So again, you get all the times and all the guests, and you'll get more info if you click there. So, and on that note as well, at the top, you can, if you have the means, please consider joining our squad and donating today. Um, it's important to note that kind of continuing to offer these unique free and important resources requires a network of support. Uh, so we kindly ask that if you can uh, consider supporting an organization by becoming a friend of Fresh Arts. Um, your support allows us to develop resources that respond to the unique needs of artists and artist-led organizations. Uh, and there you have it. So please support us if you can, join our squad. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be having a conversation with uh, Teresa Escobedo and Jamie Robertson, uh, who and they're doing interesting stuff with their work, with their practice, um, and they'll be giving us uh, a good discussion on how they've made this transition and how they're adapting and staying resilient with what they have, with the means that they have in their work. So again, thank you. Uh, tune in next Thursday at 4 p.m., and then we'll also be cooking up some really great stuff uh, in the oncoming months and summer and all that good stuff. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you around.